Aloha and welcome to Island Connections. I'm Brahim Aude. Hawaiians, 1959-2009 is our topic for the evening. And we have uh, three uh, individuals active in the uh, uh, Native Hawaiian community who would help us uh, uh, have the discussion about the state of the Hawaiian movement and especially the question of the Akaka Bill because it is very important in terms of how the Hawaiian activists now and the Hawaiian communities are uh, being uh, lined up uh, for or against uh, the uh, Akaka Bill. So uh, with us we have uh, Daviana McGregor, thank you for coming, and Kekuni Blaisdell, and Kiano Sai, thank you for coming. Aloha. Aloha. So um, why, why don't we begin by um, each of us uh, saying something about your activism and how you got uh, involved <coughs> in the um, Native Hawaiian movement, uh, just briefly so that we can inform our uh, viewers and familiarize them with uh, what uh, and who we are. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't know, I think Hawaiians are born activists uh, because, you know, we grow up uh, learning about how our queen was overthrown and how our land was stolen and so, uh, you know, something deep within us uh, is uh, organized from not organized, but you know, is stimulated from when we're young to to resist um, American um, occupation of Hawaii and and to challenge American control over our lands. Uh, but I just got a chance to get involved to do something about it when I was at the college level, and um, you know, the, the I think the first thing that that was happening while I was started college in '69 was the Kalama Valley sit-in and. Uh, then later I got, got involved with the whole struggle to establish an ethnic studies department here at UH uh, Manoa and our, our theme was, uh, our slogan was Our History, Our Way and it was an effort to tell the story of the Native Hawaiians as well as other working people in the islands and to tell it from the perspective of the common everyday people and not from the perspective of the conqueror conqueror and to challenge the dominant narrative that only attributed the accomplishments um, of you know the islands to the big five and their their, their mm -hmm. descendants and, and missionaries and their descendants uh, and then I think from there I got involved in many different movements um, Congress of Hawaiian people for a while when Matt Matsua Takabuki was appointed as the trustee and then later um, with the uh, eventually with the Protect Kohlabi Ohana, and that's been my longest involvement with, with, an, with an organization uh, to stop the bombing mm. of Kohlabi and to uh, revive our Hawaiian uh, religious practices on the island and to restore the island's okay. cultural and natural resources. Okay, great. Kekuni, please. Well, I got into the movement around 1980. Uh -huh. I had come back from America mm -hmm. to become first chair of medicine in the new medical school in 1966. Mm -hmm. But uh, I was American and Americanized, colonized, as he would say, indoctrinated. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But in 1980, I uh, first discovered, I first learned that we Kanaka Maoli in our homeland have the worst health indicators. Then I found out it wasn't confined to health, the worst mm -hmm. social economic indicators, you know, and that. I began to wake up. Mm -hmm. And then I was asked by Office of Hawaiian Affairs to help put together a document which became the Native Hawaiian Studies Commission of 1983. <coughs> And then I began to really to discover that we were not only at the bottom, but as has already been pointed out, we were landless. Uh -huh. And we had no real authority in our own homeland. Mm -hmm. So that's how I began to have to teach myself mm -hmm. that uh, our country was stolen. Got to get it back. So. Mm -hmm. I'm in the independence movement now, okay. and in a very important sense, I'm no longer an American. All right. Okay. So we'll get back to those kinds of issues uh, later <coughs> on. Kiana, please. Well, 
it really started for me um, back in 1984. My tutu was passing away. She was in hospice, Rose Reeves. I'm the oldest grandchild or the oldest mo'opuna. And my tutu would have me sit next to her and talk story with her every, every day next to her bedside at my uncle Hank Reeves' house. And we all lived in Kuleo, so it's right next door. And I would sit there and talk to my tutu. And she would tell me all these stories of when she was young. She was born in 1910. Her father was William Kuakini Samerson. Come to find out, he was one of the pallbearers of Prince Kuhio's casket. Mm -hmm. We didn't know any of these things, and my tutu starting to share it. I'm like, wow. Well, before she passed away, she said, Keanu promised me one thing, know your genealogy. She said, when you know your genealogy, you know who you are and what you need to do. I went, okay. She passed away, but I did not take her up on understanding and knowing my genealogy until 10 years later, and that was 1994. And that is when I started to do research and found out things in the archives relating to people in my genealogy where I can actually find out who they were, what jobs they held, and it naturally got me into a country called the Hawaiian Kingdom. Found out that my great-grandfather was a clerk. I found out others were attorneys. I'm like, wow. And then I started to realize that as a country, it was a fully operational country, you know, fully functioning. And then it made me understand, or I was able to understand then the overthrow, what happened. And my conclusion I came to was that the only thing that was overthrown illegally okay, was the government, not the country. Mm -hmm. The country was still intact. So in 1995, one year later, we decided to test it. And this was not part of the sovereignty movement. This was actually exercising sovereignty where we created a title company under Hawaiian Kingdom law called Perfect Title Company and the Hawaiian Kingdom Trust Company. And from that point on until you might say it took us to the world court, the permanent court of arbitration, it, it, this journey has not stopped. <laughs> it keeps getting bigger and bigger. And I decided to pursue a PhD in political science to qualify and quantify all these areas that, or, or these issues that we've covered and that we've done. And it became the basis of my dissertation. Mm -hmm. So I'm very much into education and exposure and analytical rigor because mm -hmm. a lot of our history, as Kekuni said, we've been indoctrinated to believe something that's not true. Mm -hmm. I found that certain theories, legal theory, political theory, are able to explain things that were not explainable before. And it's like a treasure chest. It's mm -hmm. like, wow. But also, knowing these things also provide pr unbelievable ramifications, mm -hmm. economic, political, and legal. So in my dissertation, what I covered in the last chapter was, how do you fix the problem? And it, it's titled, how do you right the wrong? Mm -hmm. yeah. So it's the beginning of transition. But, but from 1984 until today, <laughs> it hasn't stopped. It just, it just keeps getting bigger. Yeah. <coughs> so uh, we have here uh, like a number of um, topics that we can uh, explore. And one of uh, the things that as I'm listening to you folks uh, is the question of identity. I mean, when you talk about genealogy, et cetera, mm -hmm. it's also identity. Yeah and so on. And then there is a role, an important role, central ro role for culture. Um, you know, like in terms of knowing your genealogy, you gotta know the chance and you gotta like begin to practice the culture and see how you are different from other people on the islands uh, because you know, you're indigenous uh, to, uh, to this place. And so culture becomes important in terms of creating that <coughs> particular identity and that identity is always um, changing um, and de developing and so forth. And um, from my uh, observations, uh, I've been here since 1969, so from my uh, um, observation, limited as uh, they might be, is that um, uh, I see the development of the Native Hawaiian movement. I've seen it with my own eyes, like from like 69 all the way to uh, 76, Kahoolawe, you know, um, the takeover of Kahoolawe and so forth, and then on and on till where we are at this point. So culture plays an important thing. But uh, another thing in terms of culture, like, uh, you know, the movement itself has been um, in many ways, um, or the powers that be have tried in many ways to co-opt the movement through culture uh, by like saying, you know, for instance, how the tourist industry like. Uh, talks about culture, you know, and uh, represents the Hawaiian it's, uh, himself or herself, yeah? So um, what I did uh, is uh, I interviewed uh, Tai Tengang, 
Um, and we talked about how uh, culture <coughs> is important to identity, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. But the segment that we're going to uh, 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 see now is uh, how tourism promoted the culture of Hawaii, how to uh, the tourist industry promoted the culture of Hawaii, and things around the question of culture as it is uh, happening right now. So we'll watch that, and then we'll have discussion on it. more explicit forms of co-optation in which tourism um, supported by the state and other multinationals promotes a particular cultural image of the islands usually one is of the hula girl right which is both cultural and gendered um, and the types of cultural forms of hospitality of graciousness of aloha in a kind of abstracted form of please come in and have all that we have. If that becomes the culture of the state, the tourism culture becomes our culture, then obviously it is put in the service of welcoming increasingly more visitors, maintaining the tourist apparatus and the image of a trouble-free paradise, and also detracting our attention from the very hard material realities which are facing, including the widespread militarization of these islands and that force which enables the American presence, which people will now refer to as occupation, uh, but also colonization, settler colonialism, um, and such. So these, these forms of culture as promoted by the tourist industry and, and other industries, including the military, is one of creating a sense of always welcoming and always being hospitable and not really forcing the kinds of resistance that we need if, if we are really looking to move out of that box. Yeah, so I mean, he just gave us uh, some idea about uh, the cooptation and so forth uh, being tried. Um, Keanu, um, you have experience in the military, by the way? Yeah, could you sure. tell us something about that? Well, um, after, I tend, after I graduated from Kamehameha Schools, I went on to a military college, mm -hmm. New Mexico Military Institute, and that's where I got my commission as a second lieutenant. Mm -hmm. So um, I spent 10 years in, uh, both active and reserve. Uh, got out of the Army National Guard as a field artillery officer. So I got out as a captain. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, and uh, so do you, do you see some of the stuff uh, like that um, Tai has uh, described in his uh, segment uh, happening in the military among, for instance, um, Native Hawaiian kids in the military or something? I guess, well, Hawaiians in the military, what's interesting is <coughs> Hawaiians tend to excel in the military. Mm -hmm. When I got in, I found so many Hawaiians that were there who set a certain standard on other Hawaiians coming in. You have to be the best. I mean, th th this is something that happened to me in New Mexico military. There was a ranger, uh -huh. Sergeant Bach, okay, uh -huh. in New Mexico military. And he was on the Hawaiians' okole constantly, <laughs> just in your face, you know, back to the wall, ripping up your, 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 your bed. And he was just on us. But once we got our commission as a second lieutenant, he was the first guy to come up to us because the, the, the tradition is the first salute you get, they got to give you a silver dollar. Mm. He wanted to make sure he gave a silver dollar to every Hawaiian mm. who got their commission because he said it was the Hawaiians that protected him when he was in Vietnam. Mm. And he wanted to ensure that any Hawaiian coming out of the military college is going to be held to that standard. Mm. And I was like, wow, why didn't you tell me that before? <laughs> I hated you. <laughs> but up to that point, I was like, I understand. Yeah. So <clears throat> when I was in the military, there were a lot of Hawaiians in it. And it wasn't something alien. Mm -hmm. um, now, that's a time when I was involved when it's voluntary. Mm -hmm. Now, you also had a time when it was involuntary called draft. <laughs> mm -hmm. And that's the problem. So when I went in, it was purely voluntary. I was of another generation. But when I speak to the, the uncles, then there was some tension there. Mm -hmm. yeah. But um, regarding Hawaii as an occupied state, that was the farthest thing from my mind when I was mm -hmm. at Kamehameha, when I was at New Mexico military, even when I was talking to my tutu in 1984. But now that I look back in hindsight, it's a different situation. I'm like, oh, let me reevaluate how things are looked at. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. 
the Vienna in terms of like uh, the culture because uh, you know you practice the culture etc any comments on Thai and other things you want to add on that well, well I guess I would just say that um, you know I think as we're looking more at tourism it, it's not <coughs> inherent in the practice of tourism that it has to be um, irresponsible and you know and, and appropriating of our culture it's just the commercialization of it has has um, taken that form because it's 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 a it's an industry that is not in the hands of the native Hawaiians and it's not for Hawaiians it's it's you know was introduced first by Americans primarily and they they owned all of the tourist uh, industry in Waikiki and then then the Japanese bought them out and you know, uh, so it, it, it's a matter of who's controlling it. But beyond that, I, I, I was involved in doing a study on uh, responsible tourism for Molokai. What kind of tourism would be appropriate if it was <coughs> community-based and um, and really connected more to the community? And I think the what what I understood what we came to realize is that the main problem with tourism for me is that it's always linked to selling of real estate and selling of land. And tourism has really um, attracted so many people from America to come here and then to live here, to buy real estate, to develop real estate, and to further the alienation of Hawaiians from our land. And if you could decouple tourism from the sale of real estate, uh, it, it wouldn't be as bad as it is, but it, it's it's the wholesale of our land and our culture that is so um, uh, uh, damaging to to Native Hawaiians. Then, I, on Molokai, there's a, a bumper sticker that the community made. It says, "Molokai not for sale. Our way of life uh, and depends upon it." And and you know, people would be more accepting of peop of tourism if it didn't lead to people coming back and buying land and t and raising our property taxes and changing our lifestyle. Yeah, and making people homeless because, uh, <coughs> you know, when uh, you buy something, uh, you, you, d you don't want to rent it. You would be like for speculation, etc. And so I know like people on Kauai, uh, a lot of them are homeless uh, because the, uh, s the stock, uh, housing stock for rent for rentals yes. is de decreasing, I mean, at a high rate. Uh, I know that because um, both of my sisters-in-law are on Kauai, so they tell me one of them is on Anahola, <coughs> you know, Hawaiian homelands and stuff like that. But the other one, you know, she sometimes cannot find a place to rent, you know, so she has to go to mm -hmm. Anahola. Yeah. So, yeah, so it's uh, the yeah. artificial inflation right, of right. Uh, food prices, fish, uh, especially, um, you know, and, and of housing, it artificially inflates the cost of housing right, as yeah. well. Uh, Kekuni, uh, on that, in terms of culture and identity and tourism? And yeah, oh, oh. Well, to me, self-identity is paramount. Mm -hmm. uh, I was brought up that I had to be an American in order to survive. But I realized very early as a youngster, you know, that I was Kanaka. Mm -hmm. I had a Pake grandfather, but both of my grandmothers were Kanaka. And I had a holy grandfather, and we had to speak this, this what I found out is a foreign tongue that we're speaking right now. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but when I went to Kamehameha, then I began to learn more about the culture, although it was a military school. Mm -hmm. And there I got into the music and began to learn something of the language. And when I came back after 22 years in 1966, you know, I identified with the cultural renaissance at that time and got involved with Hui Hanai, Queen Iliokalani Children's Center, and Nana Ike Pono, you know, the two volumes that Tutu mm -hmm. Kabena Pukui made possible. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I got really involved yeah. in the culture and the language as well. Uh, yeah. mm -hmm. um, any other discussion on that point uh, before we go? Because I want to show another segment uh, from Tai Tengan's uh, um, interview. And uh, we're talking about um, similar things, but uh, in more detail. So we'll watch that. So. 
Certainly for some generations, you know, if we look historically, it was about really claiming full citizenship in the U.S. at a time where they're being denied it because of their race and at least culturally denied it. I mean, technically and legally citizens, but socially marginalized, culturally looked down upon. And so one of the avenues for really claiming this full sense of citizenship culturally, socially, as well as politically is through the military. Um, but the obvious shortcomings of that is what does that come with? Uh, really, uh, for many, a very strong internalization of these ideologies of American individualism, patriotism, loyalty, etc. Um, not to mention gender, which is my own area of focus, the particular kinds of uh, forms of masculinity and femininity that are promoted by the military, being very uh, misogynistic, patriarchal, homophobic. Um, so there's a lot of obvious problems with that. Um, but again, different periods will account for different uh, participation. Uh, of course, those who were drafted in the military had little choice uh, unless they were uh, actively resisting, um, and some did and some didn't. Uh, economics clearly is, the military is often portrayed as one of the few avenues for upward mobility for any marginalized population. Um, so the same goes for Hawaii, um, as well as other minorities in the U.S. The military one of the few avenues out of very difficult, hard lives and circumstances. Yeah, so, I mean, you were talking about that. So would you want to expand on what Ty was saying in terms of the military and, and anything from your experience as you were talking? Um, <clears throat> I really didn't see anything wrong with the military when I was in it. Mm. It's only when you come outside and you look at it yeah. within the context of Hawaii being an occupied state, right. mm -hmm. then you start to see things and it just jump, jumps out mm -hmm. at you. Mm -hmm. Now, for myself, I come from a different generation. Mm -hmm. And I think we have almost three different generations mm -hmm. here. Mm -hmm. When I went to Kamehameha schools, um, the identity issue for myself, mm -hmm. it wasn't an issue. It was, okay, I'm Hawaiian. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm amongst Hawaiians. Mm -hmm. You know, this was when Kamehameha wasn't military. Mm -hmm. Kamehameha got rid of the military. So we were much more, well, I wouldn't say open, but we didn't see things in ways that former generations did. Mm -hmm. And that's when San Island issues started to come up. All these issues, what we're watching. Mm -hmm. But I felt as a Hawaiian that I was Hawaiian. And when I went into the military, I actually perceived myself as if I was a warrior of the ancient days fighting. I remember Samuel Kamakao, the ruling chiefs, I loved that book when I was in officer's basic course because it talks about the battles. And these are the same type of strategies that are being taught in Fort Sill. And I'm like, wow, envelopment, talking about the Alapa Regiment, talking about Kahikili. I'm like, wow. So I kind of saw myself in that. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, but that's just the game we played. Mm -hmm. Now, once I got out, then I started to look back. I said, oh, okay, well, there's a different picture here. Mm -hmm. um, the military in Hawaii is an occupational force. But then I kept thinking back. But people in the military may have thought everything that I thought. They don't know it. Mm -hmm. So how do I get them to see what I see? Mm -hmm. You know, so that's the kind of balance I was looking for. Then I'm not saying military bad, we good. It's, I think, ignorance. <laughs> It's not knowing, but how do we expose, how do we get the information out? Mm -hmm. And um, that's what I, I, I've been involved with. Mm -hmm. But I do understand and appreciate the fighting that has taken in the past, mm -hmm. whether PKO, direct collision with the military and the Navy. Um, my uncle and them were all involved with that, my uncle Marshall Kaanoi and all them. So we used to have the <laughs> t-shirts you know, with the bullseye <laughs> as young kids. <laughs> but but I'm, not, not, I'm not in that generation, mm -hmm. so I can, understand it, I understand why and how it happened, but then how I deal with the military is in a very different way because as a former officer, I can speak their language. Mm -hmm. I actually gave a brief to the two-star general, General Dubik from the 25th Division in 2001 when I got back from the World Court. Mm -hmm. I was actually invited to, to present Hawaii's history mm -hmm. to the officer's corps at Schofield Barracks in the officer's club. 
and from the lieutenant all the way up to the two-star general. They were all there. And I basically presented Hawaii's Occupied. All of a sudden, you could see the audience, the officers thinking, wait a minute, this is not what I thought Hawaii was. Now they're talking, and I'm speaking, Hague Convention, Geneva Convention, Article 43, sacred sites. Now it's being framed in a different way. Yeah? But these are the same issues that happen. It's just another context has been brought in mm -hmm. to kind of elucidate and, and bring out those issues that really were a bit confusing before. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. And it led to a lot of tension. Yeah. But um, given all that... Go back, though, to Kekuni's experience, because was it your father who was on the jury uh, in the Massey case? And I yeah, think my, if you look at... Yeah, my honey father. Yeah, if you go yeah. back to uh, that kind of history about the, the role the military played absolutely. in the whole occupation and Americanization. Exactly. And Indeed. With period. the governor. Indeed. Exactly. I, think I mean, that's why the United States is here. Yeah. Mm -hmm. right. Spanish-American War, military mm -hmm. occupation. Right. Right. Exactly. It never left. Mm -hmm. That's why Pearl Harbor. Yeah. Huh? Mm -hmm. That's why the military expanding, <coughs> taking our lands. <coughs> Right? And mm -hmm. its reaction to that expansion, as well as tourism with hotels and golf courses, right. that led to land struggles such as Sand Island. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. But uh, the point, uh, <coughs> what I was going to make, like what Keanu was saying, which is very good, uh, it seems to me that uh, there's a connection or continuity in terms of the Hawaiian movement, you know. So although the generations, like you from a different generation than Kakuni, you know, and so forth, the fact of the matter, there's a continuous uh, struggle, mm -hmm. you know, and um, the torch is passed from one to another. Things change, uh, uh, processes develop, uh, you know, according to stages and all that kind of stuff, right. yeah. So where we are now, we cannot understand where we are and what you're doing if we don't understand, you know, that whole thing. Absolutely. And that was your point uh, Absolutely. also even made to the office officers there, yeah. Well, one thing that we're, as officers, we're trained this, this, in this concept of looking at history, mm -hmm. that the practical value of history is that it's a film of the past run through the projector of today onto the screen of tomorrow. Mm -hmm. That's how you, you, you develop battle uh, plans, mm -hmm. intel. Mm -hmm. But you know what? That's very Hawaiian, because when you tell a Hawaiian, look to the future, it's kava mahope, mm -hmm. the time of the past. Mm -hmm. That's the mo'olelo. Mm -hmm. And that mo'olelo is a series of stories that we try to understand, which gives us through our understanding, Ike, now we have foresight. Mm -hmm. You know, so it's a very similar concept <laughs> where everything is connected to the past. Mm -hmm. The future is an extension of that past. Mm -hmm. And I think that's why my tutu told me to know my genealogy, because that's part of my physical past. Right. There's always a connection there. You know, so that mo'oku hao is very important. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. 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 So, um, you wanted to say something else, no? <laughs> well, okay, because <laughs> uh, yeah, I want to move uh, like to um, uh, something that's very critical to the Native Hawaiian movement at this point, especially, which is uh, the Native Hawaiian uh, Reorganization Act, right? And so that's like the Akaka Bill. Yeah. So I wanted to um, like um, you know see what you folks. Uh, uh, I have to say about it because uh, I know that um, there are all kinds of agreements and disagreements uh, within the Native Hawaiian movement, uh, mm -hmm. not to mention anything outside of the Native <coughs> Hawaiian movement who are for or against it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, Devi, would you like to start on where do you see things happen and why do you look at it the way you're looking at it? Um, so we can begin the discussion. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, of the three of us, I know I'm the one that's the proponent of the Akaka Bill. And, <coughs> um, of course, the origin of the Native Hawaiian Reorganization Act is um, a response to the assault on Native Hawaiian rights that be, was represented by the Rice versus Cayetano uh, civil case. And when the Supreme Court ruled that um, the election of uh, trustees for the Office of Hawaiian Affairs was a violation of the 15th Amendment mm -hmm. because it was an election that was held and paid for and organized by the state of Hawaii. 14th Amendment. No, the 15th. 15th. 15th um, yeah. then There's 14th and 15th. Yes, yeah, so about the 15th. that opened up um, Office of Hawaiian Affairs to everyone to vote who, who was a, a resident of Hawaii and also anyone who wanted to run for trustee could without having to be Native Hawaiian. Mm -hmm. But the, the challenge uh, that came with Rice versus Caetano also said that the Office of Hawaiian Affairs, its very existence and its 
uh, benefits for Native Hawaiians was also a violation of the 14th Amendment, uh -huh. like you, mm -hmm. which we were referring mm -hmm. to. And the Supreme Court, in the case of the 14th Amendment, ruled uh, that, um, well, they didn't make a ruling. They mm -hmm. said uh, there are two different treatises we, we were looking at, one by John <coughs> Van Dyke, which it says Native Hawaiians are, you know, political indigenous so sovereign entity and, and has a history of being recognized as such by the <coughs> U.S. Congress. And the other, um, uh, by Benjamin, uh, challenges that and says Native Hawaiians have never had official recognition and are a race of people like African Americans or Mexican Americans uh, or Japanese Americans and that the uh, benefits that are going to Native Hawaiians mm -hmm. <coughs> through uh, the um, uh, different uh, Native American programs are a violation of the civil rights uh, laws mm -hmm. uh, and a violation of the 14th Amendment. So because, uh, and, but, and then the, but then the Supreme Court said, uh, you know, we're going to stay off this, this rough terrain and we're not going to make a ruling. And so it kind of left the door open that co for Congress then to come in and unequivocally uh, pass a law saying Native Hawaiians are an indigenous people and we have a, a trust relationship with Native Hawaiians and their political sovereign mm -hmm. entity similar to uh, Native American tribes. And so that's where the Akaka Bill originated, the Native Hawaiian Reorganization Act, to um, be that piece of legislation to give that recognition to Native Hawaiians. And uh, it, it, in the United States, if you don't have political sovereign and a status like Native mm -hmm. American tribes, then you know you have civil rights like other ethnic groups and racial groups, but you don't have the right of self-governance or the right to be a unique and self-determining people. That right is accorded within the framework of U.S. law to Native Americans. Mm -hmm. And when Alaska and Hawaii became a state, the issue of the status of the indigenous peoples of Alaska and Hawaii were not dealt with in the Admission Act. Um, although Native Hawaiians in the Admission Act were given recognition to have special rights to the um, former Crown and government lands. Uh, in the case of Alaska, in um, I think it's somewhere in the 80s that they passed the Native Alaska Native the Alaska Native Claims Settlement Act. 1976. 1976. So so that recognized what the rights of Native Alaskans and Eskimos and Aleuts were. Mm -hmm. And so this Native Hawaiian Reorganization Act would do the same thing for Native Hawaiians that the Alaska Native Claims Settlement mm -hmm. Act did for uh, Native Alaskans. Uh, so as long as a Hawaii is still within the framework of U.S. law, then the rights of Native Hawaiians can only fully be recognized through legislation such as the Akaka Bill. And without that, we're vulnerable to challenges which have come since the Rice versus Caetano ruling. There's been the Barrett case, the Arakaki case, the Carroll case, mm -hmm. and which challenged the existence of the Office of Hawaiian Affairs and the Hawaiian Homes Commission, Act, uh, Hawaiian Homes Commission program. And then there's also been challenges to the um, policy of the Kamehameha Schools to give preference to Native Hawaiians for admissions. And these kinds of challenges will continue until legislation like the Native American Re Reorganization Act is, is passed. Kekuni, mm -hmm. okay, would you like yeah. to rebut? Yes, yes, <laughs> yes. She's given <laughs> reasons why we cannot accept the Akaka Bill. In fact, we have to oppose it, right? Because it is being imposed on us. Right? It's a violation of our right to self determination, or as Keanu would say, it's a violation of our rights as citizens of the Hawaiian Kingdom. Right? So the United States' presence in our country is illegal. Right? Statehood Act was illegal. And this is in the step, the same direction, right? making us into. American Indians, which we are not. We are not indigenous to the United States. Right? We have to resist and oppose that. Right? Mm -hmm. We cannot accept that. Right? The United States did not ask our permission to become indigenous to the United States. We aren't. Right? That's why I have to say, you know, not an American. Mm -hmm. I'm Kanaka Maoli, mm -hmm. and that's the term that I use on this shirt. Huh? Mm -hmm. We're Kanaka Maoli. Mm -hmm. That's the name that our ancestors gave to ourselves huh? when foreigners first came. Mm -hmm. 
Kanaka means a human being. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. And Maoli means true, true real, real, real or genuine, belonging to the land, returning to the mm -hmm. land, and implies that oneness, mm -hmm. not only with the land, you know, but with the cosmos, mm -hmm. which comes from Kumulipo, mm -hmm. all right? Mm -hmm. Which is a reflection of our culture, mm -hmm. which is very different in conflict with the dominant Western culture, right? Mm -hmm. Which is based on individualism, capitalism, mm -hmm. economic exploitation, mm -hmm. Militarism, mm -hmm. you know? mm -hmm. so that's why we have to return mm -hmm. to our real ancestral and cultural roots, mm -hmm. and a cockabill is step in the wrong direction. Mm -hmm. Yeah, let me. Yeah, yeah. I'm for independence. Yeah, let me read uh, something just, and then we can continue the discussion with Askiano. Like um, I'm reading uh, from uh, a report. On that, I think from um, you, you sent it to me that one. Uh, yeah, from I, I think it's from the Office it? of Foreign Affairs. Office, Office of Foreign mm -hmm. Affairs. Okay, so it says like Senate Bill 1011 and House Resolution 2314 uh, reaffirms and expresses the policy of the U.S. regarding its political relationship with Native Hawaiian people and provides the process for the recognition by the U.S. of a Native Hawaiian government entity. And so I just want to read those two lines, yeah? Uh, so that, um, so, Keanu, what do you think of what I read and what's <laughs> 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 He has yet another viewpoint. <laughs> yeah, I know, but <laughs> <laughs> that's the idea. We want to educate people sure, and, you know, sure. educate ourselves in the process. Well, a lot of people confuse what I do and that I'm a part of the Native Hawaiian movement. Actually, I'm not. Uh -huh. I'm actually a part of a, a, a legal movement in exercising sovereignty, mm -hmm. in exposing it. Mm -hmm. um, the view that we've taken is the legal view that existed in the Hawaiian Kingdom era as it still exists today. Mm -hmm. So when you look at a Hawaiian subject, mm -hmm. which is a citizen, uh, that's a nationality, it's multi-ethnic. But the majority of Hawaiian subjects were Aboriginal or Native. Uh, was it uh, 40,000, close to 40,000? A total out of a total of 48,000. So you have 8,000 non-citizen, non-ethnic, mm -hmm. and 40,000 ethnic or Aboriginal Hawaiian. Mm -hmm. So when we look at the issue of it within the legal context, like as Daviana said, it's a matter of law. So if you look at it through U.S. law, I can completely understand what's going on. You know, I'm there, and it's an attempt to prevent the attacks. But if you look at it within Hawaiian law, and then what is between Hawaiian law and American law is international law, there is no evidence that Hawaii became a part of the United States, thereby giving the lawful authority of Congress to say anything. I mean, Congress can say whatever it wants, but if Hawaii was never made a part of it legally, then how can you enact laws that can be applied in Hawaii? Yeah. But you're looking at everything from 1900 until today, and not just the Akaka Bill. It's everything. Uh -huh. And all of that is a violation of Hawaii sovereignty uh -huh. under international law. So when I look at the Akaka Bill, I can understand why it's being done to protect assets or an attempt to protect assets today because of Rice v. Cayetano, Arakaki case and all that. But then I can also say, but the whole thing's irrelevant if we're talking Hawaiian Kingdom and this is occupation. If anything, the Akaka Bill, as the statehood and all other laws in Hawaii, that would be evidence of violating Hawaii sovereignty. So what we have is continued evidence of the violation and not as an extension of American sovereignty. The question then is, well, how do you deal with that? What we need, to, what, what, what I find interesting is trying to explain this to people where you have two different paradigms going on. <laughs> you have Hawaiian law, American law, and international law in between these two laws. <laughs> you know, and that's where the law of occupation kicks in. Mm -hmm. So the law of occupation is basically uh, codified in the Hague and Geneva Conventions where the military in a foreign state that has not been made a part of the United States must administer the laws of the occupied state they are not supposed to administer the laws of their own. Mm -hmm. They can't, imp so, e so America could not impose a Sunni bill <laughs> in Baghdad mm -hmm. unless Iraq transferred its sovereignty to the United States. Congressional laws have no effect beyond the borders of the United States. So no more could it affect Iraq than it could affect Hawaii. But because we've been led to believe that Hawaii is a part of the United States, that's what confuses everything because we lived in what we thought was the law and then now we're starting to find out that it's not how do we deal with that so i remember oha gave me a call and asked where do you stand on the akaka bill because we have a panel are you pro or con 
I said, do you have a third panel? And he goes, what's the third panel? Irrelevant. <laughs> and he laughed and he goes, okay, I see what you mean. So it's not that I try to pick a side. What I try to do is try to understand what is happening and what are the, what are the issues that are currently um, uh, affecting things. Mm -hmm. And there is no doubt that within the U.S. legal system, Hawaiian entities are being attacked. You can't deny that. And the Akaka Bill is, in a, is a means to prevent that. All it's trying to do is take OHA and Hawaiian Homes to the federal level. That's all it's doing. Hawaiian Homes used to be on the federal level before 1959. But by taking it to the federal level, I guess this angle to take it there is through federal recognition. So that's just the process within that system. Mm -hmm. um, I understand things are being done, things are happening, and you have to do something. But you also, we have to also take into consideration the bigger picture. So I can say play both sides of the fence. You know, and somebody might say, well, Keanu, how can you play both sides of the fence? When you're in the world court, you say Hawaii is an occupied state. When I'm at, commitment, when I'm at UH, I need a scholarship. I apply <laughs> <laughs> to OHA, <laughs> and I need assistance. I apply to Kamehameha schools, and I'm indigenous. <laughs> I'm not a, I, I don't mention anything about being a national of an occupied mm -hmm. state, so people would say, <laughs> you're playing two sides of the fence. <laughs> I said, well, my response is yes, because the fence is in my yard. Mm -hmm. In fact, I made my own gate. I go back and <laughs> forth. <laughs> because how can I pick and choose in my own country? But I do understand the, le the, the political reality of what we have to live in, but also the legal reality of where this is going to come out and how it's going to be resolved. Mm -hmm. So that's that delicate balance. Yeah? Mm -hmm. And I think really just education and exposure can kind of help people to take time to understand why things are done and, by all means, hold people accountable. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, Devi, um, you want to... Well, I think what we what we have is that we have two different entities, and a lot of times advocates for <coughs> independence collapse the two. So we have one entity, which is Hawaii, and Hawaii was a sovereign kingdom, or, uh, and you is, a sovereign kingdom. is a sovereign kingdom right. that is now occupied, yeah. uh, and it was a multi-ethnic sovereign kingdom. It wasn't only um, indigenous Hawaiians who were... Uh, citizens of that uh, country and there were some citizens who had been citizens and were uh, stripped of that right in the yeah, 1887 um, constitution mm -hmm. where you know mm -hmm. Asians were, mm -hmm. were also citizens mm -hmm. at, at some but point prevented from voting and mm -hmm. prevented from voting right. under the 1887 um, Bannock constitution mm -hmm. so it was a, 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 a internationally recognized sovereign kingdom right. but you know as because of the um, policy of the American <laughs> settler colonists to bring in plantation workers to minimize the uh, influence of Native Hawaiians and because Native Hawaiians were not sufficient <coughs> to provide the labor force. Um, Hawaiians were in the process of becoming a minority within Absolutely. our homeland. When they and used to be in, the majority of the national. Right. And yeah. so by 1890 census, Hawaiians were, for the first time, a minority we made up only 45 percent of the population mm -hmm. so we were in the process as Native Hawaiians of becoming an indigenous minority within Hawaii and um, if we if if that had continued along that trajectory mm -hmm. and Hawaii were to become independent and if Hawaii again is independent mm -hmm. Hawaiians would be an indigenous minority within Hawaii mm -hmm. well actually no so I know you have a different yeah. point of view but yeah. I mean f so within that logic um, whether we are part of an, a native, so, so the Native Hawaiian um, people, I believe, have sovereign rights whether Hawaii is independent or whether Hawaii continues to be in the United States. Mm -hmm. And that we as Native Hawaiians need to already design a government, a self government system to provide us autonomy within Hawaii or within the United States where we as Native people can hold on to our own ancestral lands and and we need those ancestral lands and control over that in order to promote the practices of our culture and, and our religious practices and to be able to really flourish as a culture we need to be able to have control and, and restitution of our ancestral lands that are now being controlled by the state and federal governments so I think for me it's an issue of autonomy for Native Hawaiians and, and sovereign autonomy within that either within the Hawaii Kingdom or at restored or Hawaiian Republic restored and independent or as continuing to be a state of the United States. Mm -hmm. So 
we, we but we do really have a, a, the Hawaiian Hawaii as an independent entity and then the native Hawaiian people mm. as a sovereign people with yeah. rights within yeah. either yeah. Um, yeah, I, uh, before we go, uh, we have a caller on the line. He's been waiting. Kalani from uh, Waianae. Uh, from Waimanalo, sorry. Kalani, mm -hmm. Kalani, you're on the air. Aloha, Kako. Aloha. Aloha. Uh, I have one question for uh, Keanu. Keanu, uh, what, uh, uh, well, it doesn't really bother me, but it makes me ask a lot of questions internally in terms of you not wanting to commit yourself to the Hawaiian movement, but wanting to give legal advice to Native Hawaiians in how to become independent or how to become a uh, colonial critic. I'm saying that yeah. we need to hear more commitment from you. I know the commitment from Kauka, I know the commitment from Digiana, and I know the commitment from everyone else in the movement. But it, uh, it kind of hinders me in terms of trying to, trying to uh, uh, decide if you are really with us or you are against us. Because you cannot be in between or play two sides or sit on a fence. Okay. Mahalo, Kalani. Mahalo. <laughs> Aloha, Kalani. <laughs> well, it's not a matter of whether we're on what side of the fence. I mean, we're looking at Hawaii. To me, Hawaii is its own country. The fence is irrelevant. You know, so it's not picking a side. Hawaii is not a part of the United States, period. And that Hawaii is occupied. Mm -hmm. that's, that's a pure and simple mm -hmm. context. Mm -hmm. yeah. What's happening is people are trying to fight with the United States as if the United States has sovereignty here. They don't. There is no evidence of that. Mm -hmm. You know, so it doesn't matter how many times we say they have sovereignty here, they don't. You can act like you have sovereignty in another country. It doesn't mean you have it. Mm -hmm. And what we've experienced in the last hundred years I would say 50 years, um, major indoctrination. We were, we were led to believe something that's not true. History books in Hawaii were revised to make it look as if Hawaii was annexed by a treaty. That's why we say ceded lands all the time, when in fact there's no such thing as ceded lands. There's mm -hmm. no treaty. So we're operating on false assumptions uh, that can be rebutted. So when I say we need to understand where this is at, um, the caller can rest assured that well, I'm very much involved with what's going on and there's a lot of things that I don't share that I've been involved with and what I've done in the past. And that if anybody has committed, I'm not saying who committed more or less, well, there's some things that have been taking place in the past. And what I found is the biggest issue that I have always have to deal with is ignorance. Mm -hmm. That's the biggest issue. You can't even get the point across if people are not even speaking the language with the terminology. Mm -hmm. You know, so when we look at Hawaii, we need to look at Hawaii, and I use this in my PhD, from within the legal lens. If what took place in 1893 was illegal, then we need to use legal theory to explain that illegality. We haven't been able to really look at it that way. We've always tried to, you might say, justify why we think the way we think. That's not explaining who we are. That's trying to justify who we are. Mm -hmm. And once we start to explain who we are, it's not who we think we are now. Mm -hmm. So. It's a process. Um, I teach this, <laughs> um, and it's a, it's a hard issue to, to grasp. Mm -hmm. But that's why the sovereignty movement, the reason why I say that I'm not part of the sovereignty movement, I'm using that within the context of a movement towards sovereignty. I'm not involved in a movement or towards sovereignty. My education and my background and what I've done operates on sovereignty never left. We're not mm -hmm. chasing it to get recognition, it's already there. That's mm -hmm. how we access the world court. Yeah. Yeah. You know, so it, 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 there's a different thing of okay, moving towards something versus already having something, but how do you exercise it? Yeah, good. Yeah, yeah. so what I'm going to do before we uh, continue the discussion uh, is uh, go to Tai Tengan, um, seg another segment from the interview, and uh, he's talking about things similar to this. The level to which taking cultural participation translates into political action and how that might be seen in the debate around the Akaka Bill. Um, it seems to me that in part those who are okay with just having the cultural as the, the kind of center of their participation in the Hawaiian world 
are also those who are very supportive of the Akaka bill, right? Because the the threat that the bill poses as far as longer and broader historic claims to sovereignty um, in the political scope really are not um, as important for those whose centers really are about culture and also primarily attached to those programs which enable these cultural spaces at the present, those uh, programs that are happening um, in Office of Hawaiian Affairs, Department of Hawaiian Homelands, Kamehameha Schools, the gathering and cultural, uh, get the gathering rights that are enshrined in the uh, constitution of the state. Um, other for forums for um, cultural educational activities which are occurring now, you know, these are the ones that are seen as being the most threatened uh, if the Akaka Bill should not pass. And really that's what the Akaka Bill is. It's about protecting the programs that are in place right now. There's a uh, very little in the in the in the possibilities of the bill that would that would um, lead one to see much of an extension of the the rights, uh, the lands and resources. There'll be some perhaps in the negotiations, right? Um, that may take place if the bill creates the <laughs> entity that it's meant to create. Um, but it, it, it's pretty questionable. Most people are seeing this as the way to protect the programs that are in place following the Rice v. Cayetano suit. Um, on the other hand, those who are more about the larger political ramifications the historical stakes involved in maintaining the claims of Hawaiians to full independence really see this bill as the the final consent or that would be seen as the final consent of the Hawaiian people to relinquish their full sovereignty as an independent nation or uh, or otherwise uh, including title to lands which have never been relinquished yeah, so I mean, um, th this is the quandary. I mean, um, uh, in terms of here, you have all these things that you might lose if the Akaka bill doesn't uh, pass. On the other hand, there is this other kind of problem where people are thinking about uh, would this be a final solution, regardless of what uh, you know uh, you were saying, but in terms of practical matters, is that the U.S. with its all military might, etc., might say, okay, you have arrived at a certain agreement with us, so would that extinguish, I mean, uh, not legally, I mean, by force or, you know, the, the rights of Native Hawaiians for, like, maybe at some point, uh, you know, become independent or, or something like that. You, you want to well, say something? The, yes, that, what, yeah. what Ty is assuming is that the land belong to all the citizens of Hawaii rather than to the Native Hawaiian people. Mm. My, my contention is that ever since the Maheli and the way the Maheli was set up, those lands belong to the descendants of the Kanaka Maoli, who were the people who, who were deemed to have the rights at the time that the Maheli was established. When the uh, Board of Commissioners to Quiet Land Titles started the process to determine who has land rights in Hawaii, there were only three individual, three parties who had rights, the king, the chiefs, and the people, mm -hmm. and by the people, they meant the Hawaiian people, mm -hmm. the Kanaka Maoli, because there were no other citizens. And, and the other part of the law uh, principle said, foreigners have no right to claim lands, naturalized or non-naturalized. So the lands are not the lands of all the people who later became citizens. Those lands are the ancestral lands of the Kanaka Maoli and uh, the Kanaka Maoli descendants who are the Kanaka Oibi today. And uh, so, that's the claim that we as Native Hawaiians seek to have. And it's not for the state of Hawaii to make a claim, and it's not for uh, simply the Hawaiian kingdom to claim back these lands. It's for the Native Hawaiian people, the uh, ancestral descendants of the Kanaka Maoli, who were the citizens of Hawaii in 1848. Uh, and I think the second thing is that um, the other assumption is that uh, the 
by, by recognizing the rights of Native Hawaiian people within the U.S., that somehow that will jeopardize the claims of the larger citizenship of the Hawaiian kingdom or the Hawaiian kingdom itself. And that <coughs> those, again, we're speaking of two different entities. The Hawaiian kingdom is a multi-ethnic kingdom, and whether the Native Hawaiians settle claims of our ancestral rights with the U.S. government is not going to affect the independence of the Hawaiian kingdom and the claims mm -hmm. to independence that are rightful no, and I agree, because these are two different systems, and mm -hmm. you can't say practically, let's talk about it. Mm -hmm. Hawaii is either a country or it's not a country. Right. And the United States is a country or it's not a country. It's not practically they're a country or they're not a country. And American laws only apply to the United States, mm. period. Mm -hmm. Hawaiian laws only apply to Hawaii, mm. period. Mm. British law applies to Great Britain, period. Mm. So when we talk about That's Native in terms of sorry, in terms of international law, you're well, talking do, or international or and domestic laws. Domestic laws. Ah. So Mexican okay. land title law cannot be applied <laughs> in California. No. Yeah. yeah. California land title law cannot be applied in Tijuana. Mm -hmm. You know, so we're talking about two separate entities. Right. When we talk about native tenant rights, we're talking about the rights of native tenants are in all the land of Hawaii, and that is secured. Mm -hmm. That's why you see every deed mm -hmm. in the mm -hmm. Bureau of Conveyances, exactly. it says reserving the rights of native tenants. But that is an aspect of Hawaiian kingdom law. Mm -hmm. That is not an aspect of American law. Mm -hmm. So whether Congress passes a law or not, it cannot be construed as, oh, they gave their consent to give up their sovereignty. Right. Sovereignty is in a country, not in its people. And you can't get people to believe that Congress is going to do that because Congress cannot do anything without only affecting its own territory. <laughs> so we're right back to square one. Mm -hmm. Is Hawaii part of the United States or not? So when you look at what is in the Hawaiian kingdom, it is a legal system that has Hawaiian customary law. It has access. It has all those things. It's all codified, and it's also, also in, the, in, in the court cases. But that type of system cannot exist in the United States system because of the way the legal system is. Mm -hmm. So we've been forced to f live in a system that is alien, but is, you know, you have little dots of Hawaiian on it. When you go back to what it was in 1893, and that's why I'm writing the book on Hawaiian mm -hmm. land law, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. it's amazing what's there, but it's a completely mm -hmm. different mm -hmm. system. Mm -hmm. You know, we're always trying to conflate them. Mm -hmm. They're separate. Right. And as long as we keep them separate, then that's good. Now we have to do it. How do we end the occupation? So when we speak of moving toward independence, that the Akaka Bill may prevent that, mm -hmm. occupation acknowledges independence. That's mm -hmm. why it's an occupied state. It's not moving whether or not they're going to move toward independence. Mm -hmm. So like when America uh, uh, occupied Iraq after the overthrow of their government, Iraq was still independent. It didn't move toward independence. Mm -hmm. It was moving toward restoring the government to end the occupation. Yeah. So. These are the issues that come into play, and I think a lot of times things get conflated, mm -hmm. and that's where the confusion comes. Yeah, right. yeah. yeah that's yeah. good. Um, we just have like under one minute, um, but I wanted to make this uh, point. All right, but um, the fact of the matter, though, the, that the United States is right here, how are you going to end that occupation? I mean, through legal means alone? Uh, that No, yeah. absolutely, because yeah. where, where you end the occupation is through the legal means of a court where there's the rule of law. Mm -hmm. If you try to address it politically, you got to convince everybody. Okay. But if you apply it within the rule of law, you got the Hague and Geneva Conventions, it's a matter of application. Mm -hmm. How do you speak to the U.S. military in Makua? Mm -hmm. Use Article 43 Hague Convention mm -hmm. instead of trying to use environmental okay. impact statement. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, we're flat out of time. Thank you to our viewers. Mahalo Noviloa for you coming and sharing your points of view. Okay. Um, we'll uh, see you next uh, month. Um, next, uh, year. No, next year, actually. Next <laughs> year and in February. <laughs> I forgot it was December. <laughs> next year. <laughs> All right. Thanks.